Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for March 31st, 2022. It's the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and Adafruit sponsors me to work on CircuitPython and floppy disks. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is sponsored primarily by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting takes place on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. To receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use it to skip to the parts that interest you the most. As the meeting runs 60 to 90 minutes, it's handy to have the option to skip around. And then, if you're participating, after the meeting we will post a link to the upcoming meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord and put it under the pinned messages section so you can find it when you're ready to add your hug reports and status updates at any time during the week. So as to the meeting, uh, we have five parts. After this intro, we will continue to community news and take a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on the hardware in the community. This is a little excerpt of the weekly Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a statistical overview of the entire project. Third up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is your opportunity to highlight the good things folks around you are doing and taking the time to recognize the awesome folks all around us in the community uh, on Discord, GitHub, and beyond. The fourth part, and really uh, kind of the meat of the meeting, is status updates. It's an opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to. <clears throat> Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you hope to accomplish in the next week until the next meeting. And then the final part is called In the Weeds. That's your opportunity for a more long-form discussion. These uh, can either be items that you identified ahead of time and put in the notes document, and that's super helpful. Otherwise, it can be something that uh, kind of becomes clear during status updates. And in that case, we ask that you please add the topic um, to the In the Weeds section of the notes doc as soon as you think about it. And with that, I will head over to Community News. So uh, as I'll discuss a little bit below, our very own Anne puts together the uh, Python on Hardware newsletter every week. And we take a little excerpt from the issue that comes out tomorrow and preview it here on the meeting. And there's always a lot of stuff on it. And this week I noticed just how, and would say chonky, the uh, section on Python streams is. So I chose to focus on that. Um, so she writes, Python on Hardware is all about building a cooperative ecosphere which allows contributions to be valued and to grow knowledge. And uh, then it follows with, a streams, with streams within the last week focusing on the community. So first up, we have the CircuitPython deep dive stream. I believe this was the inaugurable, inaugurable, inaugural uh, deep dive with Foamy Guy. And just a reminder, you can see the latest video and past videos on the Adafruit YouTube channel under the deep dive playlist. Next up, we've got another um, Adafruit person. John Park's CircuitPython Parsec comes out every week, and this past week was palette swapping. And you can find that on the Adafruit blog and on YouTube. Then we turn to the community outside of Adafruit. The CircuitPython Show is a new independent podcast hosted by Paul Cutler, focusing on the people doing awesome things with CircuitPython. Each episode features Paul in conversation with a guest for a 20 to 30 minute interview. The third episode aired on March 15th, featuring an interview with Professor John Gallagher. The fourth episode airs today, March 22nd, with Todd Kurt talking about microcontrollers, microcontrollers, Arduino, CircuitPython, synths, and more. And last up, also from the community, we're very happy to have Tammy. Tammy Makes Things is streaming CircuitPython. Community member and CircuitPython contributor Tammy Krevitt is streaming on Twitch. 
Her stream focuses on electronics, coding and making, with a focus on CircuitPython. The first few streams have been working on a macro pad based MIDI controller, and she's got lots of other project ideas in the works. An exact schedule for her streams is still being worked out, but she's targeting two to three streams per week. Check it out and follow now to be notified of future streams. And I appreciate whoever has been getting the uh, links in the uh, text channel, but also subscribe to the newsletter um, to get those links in your inbox. So uh, the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a, a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives and the sign-up are on adafruitdaily.com. And to go to the uh, archives, just tack on slash category slash circuit python. It highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. And uh, besides calling for you to sign up, we also call for you to contribute your own news or project. And you can do this in a number of ways. You can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. Links in the notes doc. You can also tweet. Uh, tag your tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And there is really no project too big or too small. We want to highlight people who are at all of the skill levels, all of the experience levels, and just whatever direction you take uh, your Python and your hardware. We want to hear it from you. We want to feature you, promote you, and just uh, fortify the community. So uh, yeah, step up, either subscribe or send us a link if you have been doing cool stuff. But uh, with that, uh, I'm going to pass over to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So GitHub is the nexus of the work on CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. And it tracks a bunch of helpful statistics, which we collect with a little program called Adabot. And so overall, in the last seven days or so, we had 39 pull requests merged from 22 authors. And um, I'm just going to have to go off the cuff here and recognize some names that I uh, am unfamiliar with. So Nico04, uh, Shawa J, Infamy, Masagari, U47, Baiti Evil, um, ARMS22 are some names that I don't recall seeing before or haven't seen lately. So thank you to all those authors, but particularly those who are just coming by to scratch an itch, maybe dipping your toes in. I uh, hope you would come back and help us out again with improving the uh, all this great software that we are working on. And the people who enable us to accept those changes are our reviewers. And that can consist of just leaving a comment on an issue or a pull request saying, I tried this out, I confirmed a problem, or I confirmed this is the fix, offering um, ideas for improvement of a pull request, and that makes you a reviewer. This list is of people who GitHub formally considers a reviewer who left a review, um, and we need to go through that process whenever we adopt a change. So thank you to those eight people, and thank you to everybody else who works with us to help us get the changes to the software we need. And we also like to track how many issues are opening and closing to see how we're doing on being able to respond to community issues. And this week was a really good one. There were 31 issues closed by 11 people, while there were, four, uh, while there were 17 issues open by 14 people. So not only do we have a great um, contribution rate in terms of individuals who are working on it, but we were also able to uh, keep ahead and close more issues than were created. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Scott to tell us about the core. Thank you, Jeff. OK. Uh, so the numbers for the core, we had 15 pull requests merged from 11 different authors. So thank you to all of those authors. Uh, one of them is a bot, so maybe it should be 10. <laughs> Weblate is a bot, but uh, other folks do commit through Weblate. So thank you to those folks. Uh, and then we have four reviewers. Uh, so thank you to all of our reviewers. As always, please, uh, if you're interested, step up and uh, We'd be happy to help you become a reviewer for CircuitPython. Uh, we have 10 open pull requests, which is not too bad. Um, however, it looks like seven, seven of those 10 are 29 days or older. So um, as always, please double check. If you're involved in any of those PRs, please uh, do what you can to either 
close them if they're not going to go anywhere or, or figure out what the next steps are um, so that we don't just have them languish. Um, we're okay having issues hang around, uh, but PRs we like to keep on top of. And if that uh, means pinging of, us, ping us, because sometimes yes. it's on our end that it isn't moving forward. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, those of us who are paying, paid to work on CircuitPython for Adafruit, uh, always try to prioritize contributions to CircuitPython, the broader ecosystem. So if, if you find that um, any of us who are paid by Adafruit have the keys to the kingdom that, um, and you need our help to to get something moving forward, please please let us know. We we intend on being responsive to everyone, even those folks who are not paid by Adafruit to work on stuff, uh, because we, our our goal in the long term is to make these this project uh, bigger than Adafruit itself. So we we want other folks contributing as well, and we want to make sure that those people have the resources uh, to do that. Um, so thank you for the correction, Jeff. Um, okay, so for issues-wise, for the core, we had 13 closed issues by six people and five opened by five people, so we're net down, which is good. Uh, for a total of 505 open issues, uh, this number does grow slowly over time, but not not true to, too dramatically. Um, if you want to see all the issues, you can go to github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues. Uh, the way that we kind of keep track of prioritization uh, for those of us who are paid uh, by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython is through milestones. Um, we have seven active milestones. There is currently no open issues for 7.2x, which is good. Um, hopefully we're settled out. <laughs> we had a number of revisions on 7.2 due to the re reload stuff, but I think we're, we're through that, which is good. Uh, we have five open issues for 7.3, so... Uh, we're hoping to get to pre-releases for 7.3 soon. Um, and then we have 450 long-term issues. So that's kind of a, a quick uh, go over of all the issues here. Um, and that's it for the core. Thank you, Scott. And next, uh, I will hand things over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Go ahead, Katni. Thanks, Jeff. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and a few extras. So across all of these repositories, we had 22 pull requests merged by 10 different authors and seven different reviewers. Uh, we now have 25 open pull requests. In terms of issues, we had 14 issues closed by seven people and eight open by five people, leaving us with 611 open issues. 204 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interesting, interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. If you would like to start reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Uh, take a look at the code, Test it if you have the hardware. Uh, if you don't, um, take a look at the code for syntax, syntax et cetera, and uh, leave a comment and let us know that you did. That's always super helpful. And once you get comfortable with that, we can talk about uh, moving you up to the um, actual review team. Um, in terms of contributing code or documentation, check out the issues. Good first issue is a great place to start if you're new to everything. Uh, otherwise, if you are looking for something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement are excellent choices. Um, with uh, good first issues, if you are new to everything, um, check out uh, the there's a guide on the Adafruit learning system for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. We want to make sure that you can contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, but there were a series of updated libraries, which I will not read off, but they are available in the notes. And that's where we are with the libraries. All right, thank you. And to round out the section, uh, Melissa, take us through what is up with Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and myself as the reviewer. There are currently six open pull requests amongst all the Blinka related repos. And there were four closed issues by three people and four open by four people, leaving a net of 72 open issues. There were 13,161 PyWheels downloads in the last month. 
and we are currently supporting 87 boards. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Ketney. Thank you, Scott. And now we will head over to the first round robin section called Hug Reports. Um, I will start to show how it goes. Uh, but basically, we are inviting everybody to spotlight one or more people who are doing good stuff in the community. And specificity is nice, uh, but so is just a general feeling of uh, happiness. So anyway, um, I will start off by giving a hug report to Foamy Guy. It was great to meet you and hang out a little bit. Um, we drove down to Foamy Guy's hometown and had some pizza on Sunday together. So it was nice to meet you. And thank you, Scott, for picking up and finishing the work on MDNS that I started a month or so ago. Um, Scott asked, had asked me for some well-intentioned changes, and that was great, but I didn't have the time to do them, and he picked it back up because of his interest, and I really appreciate that. And finally, a group hug. I, it feels like a long time I've been working on floppies more than CircuitPython, and it is fun, but I'm looking forward to getting more focused on CircuitPython soon. And all right, next up is Dan. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Just echoing what you said, thanks to you and Scott for the MDNS work, which sounds really intriguing and will, I think, make using Wi-Fi for like little web servers and things like that a lot easier on CircuitPython. OK. Thank you. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, echoing what you said, it was very nice to uh, to get a chance to meet you, and I am looking forward to next time up in your neck of the woods. Um, so hopefully that will be coming up pretty soon. Um, to have report to Warrior of Wire, uh, who pointed me in the right direction on some changes I wanted to make in Vector I/O. Um, that was the person that originally created that module, so I was happy to uh, get help uh, directly from the source there. To K Match and Jose David who created and shared this uh, little Vectorio function that creates uh, lines of a specified thickness, which I ended up reusing uh, in, a, in a different widget this weekend. And then um, lastly to Eva Harada for showing uh, Katni and I the process for doing the automated uh, Adabot patches and putting together some notes around that and such. So um, that's what I got, thanks. Great, and next we will go to Jerry. Hi. Uh, first of all, it's just good luck and best wishes to Tanut, and uh, enjoy every minute of the adventures ahead. And, uh, and a group hug to everybody else. Thank you. And next we will head to Katni. Hello. <clears throat> so I have a hug report also for Eva for teaching uh, Foamy Guy and I about Adabot patches and providing a notes document to go along with it. To Foamy Guy for always being up to take on side quests. Uh, to Tammy Makes Things for a lovely chat and a group hug. All right. And hello, K-Match. It feels like it's been a while. You are up. Or I hey, guess... thanks, Jeff. Yeah, you are here. Okay. Hey, yeah, I'm here. Uh, so my first one is thanks to Foamy Guy. Thanks, Tim, for the uh, stream on the Vector IO helpers. And in particular, thanks for creating a new home so that folks can swap cool things in uh, the Vector IO space. Uh, second to Scott for the continued guidance on the ESP32 S3 display work. And lastly, as a GitHub user, Suda Morris, I think they're probably working at Espressif, but they made some fixes to the ESP IDF uh, specifically on some of the things I'm working on. So it was great timing. Okay, thanks. All right. I don't have a horse in that race, but I've noticed your work and it's fun to kind of get the updates. So appreciate that. All right. And next up is Maker Melissa. Uh, let's see. Hello. I wanted to give a hug to Dan for helping out with some Blinka issues and a group hug to everyone else. Okie doke. Next, I have notes from Mark, uh, who just has a group hug. And then Paul Cutler, what is up this week? wanted to say thanks to Tim, a.k.a. Foamy Guy, for his Winamp Pi Portal project. I've been able to steal code from that for my own project, and he also gave me some pointers to help with that. Thank you. All right, and Tammy, you're next. Thanks. So I have a hug for, for Tenud, who, um, whose name got mangled in the notes doc by autocorrect, so I'll fix that in a moment, um, for helping me figure out a CircuitPython build issue that I ran into yesterday, um, to Foamy Guy for the great live streams recently, 
reciprocal um, hug to Katni for a great conversation the other day and a group hug to everybody. All right. And Scott, what do you have to say for yourself? Oh, maybe that sounded bad. What's up, Scott? Hello. <laughs> um, first, a hug report to Purples for eyes on my pending C3 PR on Friday. I have, was like trying and trying to get USB working and it wasn't working and Purples pinged me and said, hey, did you see this code that you left in there? And I was like, oh, I didn't realize I had. And, and that got me over the hump. And so I'm excited to continue that work today. So thank you to Purples for that. And then also thank you to Dishipu. I was going over Discord and Dishipu had a really good explanation of why telling somebody to read the manual is really unhelpful. So um, I thought that was really great. So thank you to Dishipu for that uh, explanation in in Discord. I think it was an off-topic as well. All right. Thanks, Scott. And mm -hmm. to round out this section, I have some notes from Tetric. They have a hug for Foamy Guy, Dan H., and Naradoc for reviewing PRs over the last week. A hug to Foamy Guy for having a diligent eye when it comes to typing PRs, and a group hug. And that concludes Hug Reports. So time to get down to talking about business, which is status updates. This is another round robin where uh, mostly we want you to share what you've been up to in the last week and go a little longer if you haven't been able to join us for a while, and then what you plan to get up to within the next week. And uh, if there's any discussion topics that come up, please jot those down in the weeds and we will come back to it uh, once we finish status updates. So I will lead. Last week I finished up floppy interfacing to the Apple Disk 2. Uh, though there are still two more PRs to be merged in Flux Engine and Grease Weasel. And this week, it may be the last week of floppy work, at least for a bit. I'm adding support for WAS files as an input output format for Flux Engine because that is uh, kind of the gateway to the world of Apple II floppy disks. .waz is the most widely used format, so it's what we're going to add, although there are some others. All right, and next up is Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, as Scott mentioned, um, we had uh, one a day vitamin of CircuitPython releases Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday last week, to try to fix auto reload and uh, add BLEIO back to Matrix Portal. Um, there's still one problem. I think supervisor.reload doesn't work properly in certain cases, but that's uh, used by fewer people, so we're not going to do yet another release right away for that. Um, I'm working on the Adafruit request library. Originally, I just wanted to add um, async features to it, but I started looking at it and I did some cleanup work to remove some pre 7.0 things that in it that were no longer needed. The next thing I'm going to do is clean up the exceptions because um, we could make the exceptions more like the regular C Python request library. And then I will start working on adding async so that I, it can throw reasonable requests as, as reasonable exceptions as well. So that's what I'll be doing in the near future. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And next is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, last week I made a sweep through open PRs for reviews and testing. Uh, mostly yesterday is when I did this. I did a couple others previously, but I did the bulk of them yesterday and this morning. Um, I have a few to follow up on that I left notes on that I will check in on later this week and a few more to get through into that list. Um, I made a, another port of the Time Stamper project. Um, originally, this ran on the macro pad. Katni uh, moved it over to the a Feather with NeoKey, um, and then I made a new version that runs on the Feather TFT this week. Um, I worked on uh, an enhancement inside uh, vector IO in the core to allow the user to specify different colors, um, different color indexes within the palette. It used to just always take the first color in the palette, but now you can specify. Um, I also created a vector IO helpers library that will hold some like Python level code that's a little bit higher level than the, the core module stuff. Um, but it builds on top of that core module vector IO. So the first two things in there are a class that helps you create a line and a class that helps you create a, uh, an outlined rectangle, a rectangle that has a border line around it. Um, some things I'm gonna get into this week, I need to do some more specific testing of that uh, outlined rectangle to see if it's actually 
saving RAM uh, over the one that's inside display shapes. That was the original intention, um, but I have not actually measured it yet. So I don't know for sure if we actually get improvement there. Um, and then uh, also this week, I'll be working on a page about typing in the, the sharing a library guide. Uh, was kind of got started on that a little bit last week and definitely meant to get more of it done. Um, and I got some of it out of my head into a local file, but did not end up getting it into the learn guide. So I'll be uh, wrapping that up this week. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you. Great. And next we will go to Jerry. There's that button. Um, let me go figure out where I was. Um, thanks. So yeah, just a couple little things this week. I I, I found a, I was playing with the uh, LSM 6DS um, library and I had noticed that there's a temperature reading that's available in there. It's not in any of the uh, demos or the examples. So I tried it out and was surprised that the values were completely weird. So dug into it a little bit and, and it looks like, to, and I don't know the history, but the con the conversion that was being used was just not right, uh, not according to the data sheet. So I fixed it and it seems to be working better now. Um, I don't know how accurate those are supposed to be. They don't seem to be super accurate, but they seem to be useful. Uh, it seems to be working better now. And then uh, I was also playing with um, with the ESP32 C3 build, which uh, has no native USB. I was trying to, you know, in the past I, I had made a modification to Ampy to be able to load files to it. And uh, I think it was Dan had mentioned that our shell was probably the, the better thing for talking to boards. And so I found that both Ampy and our shell suffer from the same problem as that they require or expect you to, the board to have you been ASCII where our builds have been ASCII. So um, I, I made a simple change to the code to, to do a try accept. And if it fails to find you been ASCII, it imports been ASCII. And so now our shell works really nicely with the uh, C3 board. Um, it's, it's, it can only write to boards that um, have writable file systems, which most of the CircuitPython builds don't have. So I'm not sure how, how much anyone will use our shell with CircuitPython boards. But I did put a PR in um, in case somebody wants to know how to do it. And uh, similarly, there's been a PR to do that pending for Abby for quite a while. But uh, but it's nice to have our shell working with that with that C3 board. That's it. All right, thank you. And next is Katney. Hello. So last week I uh, worked with Liz to get her started on product guides. She got two new product guides into moderation. I got caught up on blogging my own new and updated guides and then updated a couple of guides, one new, which is the Cutie Pie ESP32 C3 guide and one needing updates, which is the ultimate GPS guide. Today so far, fix the ESP32 S2 internet, site, CircuitPython internet test page that's mirrored into a ton of other guides um, to not need a separate libraries page and to make it ESP32 agnostic to be ready for the S3 and the C3 and mirrored it into the last of the S2 guides, and then deleted the now obsolete CircuitPython internet libraries page. This week, I'll be working with Liz again, this time to get her started with STEM QT revision guide updates. Um, I have a MicroPython PR that I need to um, fix to get passing CI. It is not currently passing. Um, and I think I know what I have to do. So that will be uh, sometime soon. Um, I need to update the Feather ESP32 S2 page to re or whole guide rather to reflect a change in the low power pin. Um, the usage of it was inverted in the new version and there's going to be a block of code that um, works with both. So it'll disable or enable based on what you want um, either version of it so you don't have to figure out which one you have. Um, I need to strengthen the Wi-Fi example in the Adafruit I.O. template so it won't crash if Wi-Fi connectivity is lost. Um, it's a simple addition of a few try and accept, but uh, I'm less familiar with the MQTT Adafruit I.O. usage, so I needed some help with that, and I got that from Brent last week. Um, and then if I run into issues, uh, he said to ping him, so that's good. Um, this week I plan to run my first Adabot patch to update the black version in pre-commit. Um, I have some various miscellaneous on my list, and then still on my list, because uh, it keeps getting bumped, is the Essentials Template for Async I.O. And that's what I've got. All right, thank you. 
Next is KMatch. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So continuing work on using the ESP32 S3's uh, ability to run uh, dot clock displays. And uh, this week, I uh, verified that a recent commit by Espressive to the IDF helps resolve an issue that I found a, a week or so ago. So it's perfect timing. So and I uh, verified that it works. Uh, second thing is I made a small stem QT sensor slot, just a way of holding onto a cable so you can plug uh, sensors in and out fairly easily and put up some pictures and uh, some quick photos of that. Um, uh, as uh, Foamy guy mentioned, I uh, dusted off some vector IO helper code that I'd worked with on uh, with uh, Jose David uh, for drawing lines, and he got that into the uh, helper library. Uh, but in the process and in, in watching his stream, I realized that if you want to connect a bunch of lines together, it takes a lot of work to make sure they look good. And there's actually a special area of graphics math called offset polygons trying to solve that issue in different ways. So I don't know if I'll get to looking at that, but uh, if anybody's interested, there's uh, there's some rabbit holes to, to trace down. Uh, and then this week, um, I'm going to do a first cut at getting this ESP32 S3 RGB display code into CircuitPython's display I.O. That's it. All right. Thank you. And next is Maker Melissa. Hello. Oh, so last week, I uh, rewrote both the MagTag and PyPortal Google Calendar learn guide examples to work on CircuitPython 7 later by making better use of the portal libraries. I started working on the on 1.47 and 1.9 inch display guides by getting some templates ready and adding CircuitPython and Python examples to the displays. And this week I will continue the display guides once the templates have been approved. And that's it. All right, next I'm gonna read some notes from Mark. Um, and Tectric, you didn't mark in your status updates whether you're here or not, so if you are needing me to read that, could you just mark that on there? Thank you. Uh, anyway, Mark writes, uh, want to finish the Zeeland module, uh, but dealing with an insurance claim due, an I due to an ice dam leaking into my house and finding vermiculite insulation in my attic, so time to do fun projects has been limited. And that brings us to Tammy Makes, Tammy makes Things. Go ahead, Tammy. Thanks. So um, last week I worked on my live stream projects. Um, I'm on, I think, almost the last round of tweaks and extensions and enhancements to my MacroPad MIDI controller, um, which is now completely cooperatively multitasking with Async I.O., which was a fun thing to figure out yesterday. So I'm starting to figure out what the next projects I want to work on for that are. Um, I figured out a fix for the problem that I've been having with the PICU um, tool on the macro pad and I think on other RP2040 boards. Um, so I have to test that fix and submit a PR, which leads to a question that I asked that's in the, in the weeds section. So we'll talk about it. And I'm in my last two and a half weeks in my current job before I start a new role as a Python data engineer for a marketing technology company at the beginning of April. So my free time for working on projects is probably going to be somewhat limited for the next two or three weeks. And that's what I got. All right. Thank you. And good luck on that transition. And remember, if you need to take a little time away, we will be here when you get back. So yeah, do what you need for yourself first. Uh, anyway, that brings us to Scott. Hello. Uh, the main thing taking brain space for me is the fact that there is a baby imminent. <laughs> Uh, the baby's due date is on Friday, which is kind of mind-blowing for me. Um, but yeah, that's coming, and I will drop a note in the Discord when I'm officially kind of like sucked away for that. Um, last week, I did more work on Reload. Uh, fixed an issue with uh, supervisor.reload. Fixed that. Um, I'm working on adding an MDNS module. If you don't know what MDNS is, it's maybe I covered it last week, but it's really neat. It allows... Um, for a device on your network to basically respond to a DNS query. So you could say, like, I'm looking, if, if you type in your browser circuitpython.local, um, your host computer will broadcast out to local devices, say, like, does anybody, is anybody called CircuitPython? And if so, they can respond with their IP, and then you'll pull up that web page. 
Um, so it's a really neat uh, way to find a CircuitPython device on your network. And I've got some ideas about um, how to leverage that for a web workflow, uh, which I laid out in an issue uh, about a, an issue on, on Adafruit CircuitPython issues. So basically, once you find one device on your network, that device can tell you what all of the other devices are, <laughs> which would be super handy. Um, the trickiest bit of all that, I think, is probably figuring out how to change how we do credentials and stuff for native Wi-Fi. So that's the that's the thing that I probably won't figure out before the baby arrives, but um, can lay some groundwork before then. Um, I have a side quest going after the MDNS stuff. It's getting CircuitPython going on the Cutie Pie C3. Um, the C3, the Cutie Pie is set up to use the native onboard, like the in-chip serial to serial and JTAG to USB converter. Um, so I've got that going. Thank you to Purples again for pointing out something I had missed. Um, so I should be able to get like the serial connection over that converter, which will allow us to use the C3. And thank you to Jerry for kind of paving the way in terms of getting our shell working with that. Um, so that should be out today. And that PR also has some changes to the code size check for ESP builds. It was all hard coded for S2 uh, before. And so we were actually failing we were failing code size checks for C3 builds, even though we have a different partition layout that actually gives them more space than what it was accounting for. Um, so that should now be, with that PR, it will also, it will depend on the partition CSV file to decide whether it had enough space or not. So doing that, and then I also have a, another, I had this weirdo USB OTG ES Espresso board that they did for the S3. Um, so I'm planning on making a board def for that as well, just because I have it and I got a USB ID for it. So I might as well do that this week too. So lots of small things, nothing too large. <laughs> um, All right. Well, thanks in particular for that code size thing. I think I may have written what we had before and yeah, it was definitely a get it done kind of situation rather than a do it right. So thanks for That's making fine. that better than it was no i mean that's that's the way i like to work right like get get it working get it useful and then iterate on it when you when you need it to do more all right and then to finish up the section i am going to read the notes from tectric tectric writes last week forever slowly burning down the number of type annotation prs submitted a pr for using multiple wi-fi settings in the portal base library i need to look for that Fixing some mismatched parameter types in the display driver libraries. Finalizing adding iterable touchpad functionality to the circuit playground library. Making errors due to faulty code in the WSGI library easier to understand. And getting my new laptop set up with a proper Linux environment. Goodbye WSL. And this week, uh, Tectric is looking for older issues to tackle in the libraries. And that wraps up status updates, bringing us to In the Weeds. We've got three topics, uh, the first two of which are from KMatch. So KMatch, I will hand it over to you. Okay. All right, thanks, Jeff. So my two are relatively fast items, uh, both uh, related to ESP32 S3. Uh, first off is that uh, I think the parallel display got pulled into a separate module, which probably makes sense since most boards wouldn't need that. Uh, so I assume that we'd want a separate module uh, for the dot clock work. Uh, I assume that's that's a, a yes. But if so, what should it be named? And, and uh, I assume I'll stuff it in something similar to what Parallel Display does. Scott, I assume that you... Okay. <laughs> I agree it should be a separate module, and I have no issue with calling it dot clock display. Okay, okay. All right. So Perfect. I think Good I think you're going the right direction. Okay, excellent. Just need to know so easier to start that way rather than having to redo it if, if necessary. But you can yeah, always monitor good. and adjust, as you said. Right. It's good that it's good to have a separate module because I know we'll have different ports that do or don't support it. Yeah. Yeah. And probably most would wouldn't need this. So. Yeah, um, I know. I know related for, note. I think oh, STM and some other IMXs would could po possibly have it too, but. We want to be able to okay. enable that separately. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and then a related note. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, that some of the display code um, 
will only work right if I used a more recent version of the IDF. So I'd like to build it with a new version. So Jeff, you mentioned that you can check it out locally. So uh, just to clarify, so inside the ports, I think it's ports expressive. Uh, yeah. Is that where I need to clone the IDF? And so you will have already created the ESP IDF or it'll be there if you can build CircuitPython. Yeah. So it'll be ports expressive ESP IDF and you can just change okay. directories into there and then when you run a git command it's going to be on just the esp idf submodule so you can say git fetch git checkout Got and it. all of those things the main thing to be Got aware it. of is when you run commands that will work on the submodules like git submodule update or that top yeah. level make file rule that updates them in the more intelligent way that it may okay. discard the change that you've made and just go back to the default so be aware of that before you go running those commands. Got it. Okay. All right. Are, that's are that's the, clear now. So, are the fixes you have on the the four four branch from Espresso? Mm, I don't. I don't think so. I think they're just on master. Okay, because I think you're gonna have a lot of work to switch to master at this point. Because I think they that they're working on five point in master right now, and I think yeah. they're changing a lot of stuff. So, I would. Okay suggest encouraging them backporting to 4.4 because I don't really like to be on master with them uh, yeah. because they do a lot of reorganization on master. So I think it's, they're, they're they still do a lot of changes on their release branches, but they don't do large ones. They do bug fixes. And so I think generally yeah. I, I like our, I like us staying on the latest release branch rather than on master for them. Okay. Yeah. The question, it'll be a question whether I can, can I just commit just what those ones that I need onto four, four and a fork and do it that yeah, way. We if, do that. If that works. We, yeah. We have an Adafruit ESP IDF. Uh, if we want to switch back to it, I just switched us from there back to regular espresso, but we can switch away again if we need to. I, I was saying even just for me building it, because if, if I go to the master and it breaks everything, then that won't help me at all. So I bet I won't it will. <laughs> okay. I would uh, expect it okay, too. So, so you may, yeah, you may want to try cherry picking before you go to master. Got it. Um, okay. All right. Well, thanks for the warning on that. So that maybe yeah, I don't know exactly work. when they're, I don't know when they're planning on making five zero. But yeah, I haven't seen any timeline on that. So, uh, okay, that may be a blocking point if I can't get that to work. But but that's good to know what I'm up against. And you can ask them. They're pretty responsive in terms of backporting stuff. Like they've they've been changing oh. a lot uh, on four four, or at least fixing a lot. I think. Like okay. we I'll we check that out. You know, we had two patches that we were carrying on our version of the IDF, and we don't need either one of them now because they fixed it in their release branch. Got it. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll just if I don't see it ported against four four, then I'll ask if maybe they could stuff it in there. Yep, that would be good. All right. Okay. Good point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. All right. Then the third topic is from Tammy Makes Things. So take it away, Tammy. Okay. So um, I've been working on fixing the, the PICQ tool, which is a um, circuit Python dependency management and deployment tool, because when I run it on the macro pad, it says it can't deploy to the board because the board size is larger than expected. And I looked at the code. And the reason why it's saying that is because the code assumes that you're never going to have a circuit Python device with more than three megs of flash, which obviously is not true of all of our boards. So I wanted to figure out a good way for the host system to determine when it finds that circuit Python device connected, what architecture it is and potentially what um, flash size we should expect it to have. And I'm trying to figure out what's a good idiomatic way to do that. Right now, I've got some test code that's just parsing the board, the boot underscore out dot txt. And I don't know if that's the right way. And relatedly, um, I'm not totally sure where in the circuit Python code base the content of boot underscore out dot txt is generated. And I want to look at that code because I want to make sure that there aren't variations in the formatting that are going to trip me up if I try and parse that file. I think so. That, any suggestions or pointers would be great. I think that the place it's generated is from the main.c file in the very top 
level directory of CircuitPython, uh, but I can't pull that up right this second to confirm that during the meeting, but that's what my memory says. And I that, see Dan. That, that's correct. Okay. I see Dan has notes here. Do you want to tell us uh, what you were saying, Dan? Yeah. So I, you were saying where to put it. Um, we have this library, Adafruit Board Toolkit, which right now gives you um, information about the serial ports that are connected to the host computer. But the idea was that was that was a general thing to talk to board, thing to find out things about boards that were attached. So okay. um, you could make that be uh, like a sub module or something, you know, a separate import if you want to add. I, I would say I add it to that library rather than making it a new library. Okay, I'll Maybe definitely take a look at that. And then the other thing is that there's a tool by Naradoc called Disco Tool, which overlaps in functionality with Adafruit Board Toolkit. It actually shares some of the same code because he wrote some of it. So you could take a look at that. Okay. And then Great. finally, you can parse board out.txt. You could also um, look at the USB uh, p uh, vendor ID and PID and figure out something from that. But if it's a board that isn't in, we have to keep a table of those. We have an internal table that we haven't published because it includes like unreleased products and things like that. So uh, that's another way to find out. But okay. I think parsing boot out that text is, is, it will always give you an answer. Okay. Okay. I, I think that's probably better in the long run because keeping a, a vidpid table up to date has been a nightmare for in various ways, or it's just another thing to keep up to date. <laughs> right. That was what I was thinking. Okay. Well, that gives me a place to start. I think the other, the other thing I would suggest is I wonder why it's not just asking the OS how big that partition is. Right. Like I, I think, well, it is, but I think what it's trying to do is it's trying to make sure that whatever is mounted on slash, mount slash whatever slash circuit pi is actually a circuit python device and that it's uh, not finding like a one terabyte hard drive out there or something but i well, suppose it's also an open question why the tool needs to care yeah the the thing i'm thinking of is like we're starting to do more native sd card stuff and i know for the broadcom port we put circuit pi on a, an sd card so it will change per it will change it won't the size of it won't be fixed for a given board ID because okay. it depends on your SD card that you're using. Um, and I would expect more boards to be like that in the future. So maybe the answer is that it would be useful to add some board probing stuff to the Adafruit board toolkit and also to remove that is the board sensibly large check from PICU because there's not maybe a good way to do that. Yeah, okay. yeah, and I don't have a good option. I don't know. Like uh, on Linux, at least we have we probably have dev disk by ID that could probably correlate the mounted volume to the USB device, but I don't know if that's always true. I I missed. Does PICU? You... Why is PICU bothering to check the size? Because it might just be a USB drive. I think that's why. I don't know for sure, but I, I think it's to make sure for, that yeah. what it found is actually a circuit python device. I think that's pretty uninteresting. I mean, you could always check to see whether bootout.txt exists at all. And that would tell you make it more likely that it's circuit python board, but basing it on the size doesn't sound very interesting either. Yeah. So, I okay. think that just taking that check, I don't, you know, like what is the what is the error case that uh, M. Rillison is trying to cover here. And maybe yeah. it's not so interesting. So, you know, maybe it's so rare that it's not worth checking. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Thank you, Timmy. All right. And that wraps up in the weeds. And therefore, that is going to wrap up the meeting. So uh, I just need to find the wrap up text. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 31st, 2022. Thanks to everybody who participated. And for those of you who listened, I hope you found it an interesting or informative experience. To support CircuitPython and Adafruit, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. 
And if you're international, there is a link of distributors at the bottom of every page on adafruit.com. Uh, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit. And the podcast will be available on major podcast services. And of course, it's very helpful to us when you, uh, you know, use the subscribe functionality in your favorite service. Uh, we also feature it in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter as one of many, many, many things. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that weekly newsletter. Uh, the next meeting will be held at the usual time of 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on March 28th. And the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We have people in time zones all around the world who would love to talk to you about your CircuitPython, Adafruit, electronics project, whatever you're doing, sewing project. We want to hear about it, and somebody will uh, maybe even step in to help with where you're stuck. Anyway, to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And that wraps it all up. We hope to see you next week. Have a good week, everybody.